Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you for leading us into the presence of God. It's so good. Every single week, God is so faithful to show up. And, you know, it's his word. The Bible says God is enthroned on the praises of his people, right? And as we give and as we worship, as we say, God, here we are, come, be exalted. We worship you. Lift up the name of Jesus. God comes and his presence is here. Amen. That's the, the principle of God. It's just the way it works. But it's a, a major blessing in our lives. How many people were blessed during worship today? Yeah, it was good. So good. Well, we're going to continue this week. We're going to continue in our series on the Ten Commandments. And as you know, if you've been here the last four weeks, we've been uh, talking about the Ten Commandments, but from a different angle that, you know, the Ten Commandments isn't the law that we have to follow in order to be saved or to earn redemption from God. That's not the way it is. Even in the Bible, like we, we've talked about the last few weeks, even in the Bible, the children of Israel did not receive redemption by keeping the Ten Commandments. But they were delivered by God. They were delivered through the very first Passover. God led them through the Red Sea miraculously. And then when they came into the, uh, the wilderness and they started as the community of God, even before they entered the, the promised land, they were the nation of God. But God gave the Ten Commandments as laws so that they can facilitate a good relationship with God and with others as well. And that's what we have. The first, four ten, the first four of the Ten Commandments talk about our relationship with God. Uh, the first one is, you shall have no other gods before me. Second one is, don't make an idol or any images or anything like that. Don't bow down and worship them. These are all about our relationship with God. And then last week we talked about the name of God. And I love the songs that we sang today, the, the, uh, <clears throat> about the powerful name of God. Uh, and it's, it's so true. The name of God is powerful, and God wants us to lift up the name of Jesus above all else. Today we're going to talk about the fourth commandment, and it's the Sabbath commandment. It's the Sabbath commandment. Before we do, I want to tell you a short story. There was a father, and he had a son. And his son was... Uh, he wasn't doing so good in school. He was getting some failing grades. And he was kind of, nah, he wasn't a rebellious kid, but he was kind of, you know, just sort of living his, his way. And, you know, kind of, he grew his hair real long and, you know, kind of that sort of lifestyle. And, uh, you know, he had long hair and he had bad grades and he wasn't reading his Bible and doing his devotions and stuff like that. But he came to his dad and he said, Dad, he said, he said, I want to drive the car. You know, he was old enough to drive. He wants to get his license and everything like that. And his dad says, okay, well, well, I'll make three conditions for you. The first one is you got to, you know, get your grades up and start doing better in school. The second one is, you know, read your Bible and make sure you're doing your devotions every week. And the third one is I want you to cut your hair. And uh, so, you know, a few weeks go by, a couple months go by, and... Uh, the son comes back to his dad and he says, Dad, he said, I've been, uh, been doing good and my grades in school are better, starting to get some B's and A's and passing grades and all that sort of stuff and doing good in that. And, uh, you know, I've been reading the Bible and I'm doing my devotions and all that sort of thing too. And the dad said, well, he said, he said uh, yeah, that's good, son, that's good. You've, you, you are doing those things. I have noticed. It's, it's good job. I see your report cards and all that sort of stuff and and I see you getting into the Word of God, and that's great, but you haven't cut your hair yet. And uh, the son comes back, comes back to his dad and says, well, you know, Dad, I've been reading the Bible. You know, there was, there was people in the Bible. You know, there was uh, uh, Samson. He had, uh, he had long hair. And uh, even Jesus, you know, Jesus had long hair too. And the dad looked back at him and said, yeah, but Samson and Jesus, they walked everywhere they went too. <laughs> So I don't know if he ever cut his hair and got his license or not. I don't know, but that was his dad's witty comeback. So anyways, that has nothing to do with my, uh, with my topic today. It's just kind of a funny story I heard. 
We're into the fourth commandment, and let's put it up on the, on the screen here. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Uh, we have the first three verses, and the last one is on the slide there. Let me just read this for us. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the so sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." So this is the fourth command. It's actually the longest command because it has these kind of instructions and explanations afterwards. And this is in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, in the following verses, you have all the rest of the commands as well. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5, God repeats all of the Ten Commands. And I want to read this fourth command in Deuteronomy chapter 5 because there's a little bit of a different explanation there in the following verses. And I'm going to refer to that uh, in just a little bit. Uh, so Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15, it says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. One more verse, next slide. You shall, okay, so I want you guys to remember this. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So this is the fourth commandment. And for each of the, the first three commandments, and for all of the commandments, we have principles. This fourth command is the principle of rest. It's the principle of rest. It's a principle of rest that we as Christians need to exercise. It's something that we need to practice on a regular basis. If you look in the Bible, it talks a lot about rest. Hebrews, the whole book of, almost the whole book of Hebrews talks about the rest that we have in Christ Jesus. It's not, it's not about our works anymore. It's about resting in the promises of God, resting in the finished work of God. We don't have to go and sacri make sacrifices and burnt offerings anymore. Jesus did it all on the cross, but the author of Hebrews says it's time to rest. Trust in the work that God has done and rest. And that's what this principle is about. It's the principle of rest. And so we're going to talk about rest. Why do we need to rest? Why do we need a Sabbath? And I want to read a few things. I've been reading a few books about this. And if you're a reader, I would really highly suggest a book by uh, Robert Morris. Uh, it's a book called Take the Day Off. And it's all about the Sabbath. Excellent, excellent book. And some of these principles that we have in here are taken from that book. But it's called Take the Day Off uh, by Pastor Robert Morris. Uh, in that, he, he outlines some things that might be signs that you need to take a rest. And it's not something that he has made up. It's something that... Um, uh, people who have done studies, doctors, psychiatrists, have seen as signs that people might need a rest. So here's, here's a list of a few of the things. Signs that you might need to take a rest. You lack the energy needed to do all of the physical tasks on your to-do list. You feel tired, but you have difficulty falling asleep. You have a weak immune system with frequent illnesses. You experience frequent muscle pain and soreness. You depend on substances to give you more energy. Caffeine, energy bars, sugar, etc., etc. 
I think I might be guilty of the caffeine one there. Uh, also in that, in that book, it talks about signs that you might be close to burnout. You have a sense of failure or self-doubt. You have feeling, you're, you're, you're feeling helpless, trapped, and defeated. You have feelings of detachment, feeling alone in the world, a loss of motivation. You're increasingly cynical, and you have a negative outlook. These could all be signs that we need rest. Decreased satisfaction and sense of accomplishment. God made rest. And God made us to, to function on rest. He made it right from the very beginning, even before there was laws. He incorporated it himself. He created the world in six days, and what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. He rested. This was way, way, way before we even had a law, the fourth commandment. It was something that God said, this is something that you should do. This is something that I did, and it's something that we should all do. God values rest, and God wants us to value rest as well. And so the Sabbath principle is a principle of rest, but it's a principle that we can, uh, that we can practice on a daily and on a weekly basis. It's not something we're just, okay, yeah, I got to remember that rest is important. No, let's not just remember that it's important. Let's actually do it because that's what we were created to do and how we were to live. Here's a maybe a little bit of a controversial question. But I want you to think about it. Why do we think that we should keep all of the Ten Commandments, but we don't have to keep this one law about the Sabbath? Of course, we would say, yeah, let's not murder. Stealing's wrong. Lying's wrong. But a lot of times, we don't put as much effort into our Sabbath rest. A lot of times we don't. We just, okay, yeah, we have a day off or whatever, but I'm going to go and do my chores and, you know, do this and do that and have this appointment and have that appointment. And we don't guard. We answer our emails. We answer our text messages about work and this and that. But I believe that God wants us to detach from those things. And this is the principle of rest and say, okay, no, I'm going to take a rest from those things. And I'm going to trust because rest equals trust because you're trusting in the Lord. But I think God wants us to take the Sabbath a little more seriously. I heard a story about the same uh, Robert Morris, and he had his own experience. He almost burned out himself. He has, uh, he has a testimony about uh, when, he, when he realized that, boy, I need, the, I need to have the Sabbath in my life. So he made a drastic change in his life personally, but as a leader of his church, he said, we are all going to have Sabbaths. And after, after that experience and after it was started to um, be practiced in their church, he makes it a policy that everyone must take their Sabbath and everyone must take their vacation as well. And so after a little while, he met with one of his staff members that he heard was not taking their vacation. And... In the United States and in some places and some uh, churches and corporations, sometimes what they'll do is you get a certain amount of uh, vacation days and you're allowed to save them up or whatever and you can use them when you want. You just have to tell them and it's paid vacation and all that. But Robert Morris heard this, that this one staff member in his church wasn't taking his vacation. And so he called him into his office and he said, I heard that you're not, you know, you're not taking your vacation. He said, what's up with that? And he, basically, Robert Morris said to him, he said, he said, this today is Friday, and if you come to work on Monday, you're fired. That's how serious he was about it. I want you to start your vacation on Monday, and I need you to take all, your, all of your vacation days, because he knows how important this principle of rest is. And I think it's something that we also need to maybe take it up a notch or a level or two in our evaluation and in our, in our thinking about, okay, yeah, no, rest is something that is so, so important and so valuable to God that not only, not only he gave us a law about it, 
but he actually did it himself. And if God needs rest, who are we to say that we don't need rest? Right? If God himself, the God of the universe, he created everything. Are we better than God? I hope we don't say yeah. Okay? If God needs rest, we also need rest. Why do we need rest? Well, the first point that I have is it gives God the opportunity to provide for us supernaturally. In our relationship with God, a big part of our relationship with God is the principle of trust. And God is our source. God is our provider. God is everything that we need. And when we take a day off, we're saying, God, I don't need to work six days. I mean, I don't need to work seven days. I'm going to trust you and say, okay, with this seventh day, I'm going to trust that God will provide enough for me in that seventh day. But in that, he's also going to restore me and renew me and bring strength as I rest so that starting on day one again, I'll have the strength to go for another six days. And then he'll provide for me again on the seventh day when I stop and I choose not to work. And then just repeat that cycle over and over. In when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God provided manna. Okay, this is the, the God, this, is, this story is kind of a, a, an explanation of God's provision through the Sabbath. And so what happened is God said to Moses, tell the children of Israel that for six days, you're going to go out and collect manna every single day. Day one, you go and get manna. Day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. But on the seventh day, don't go out and get any manna. Okay, so they had to go out and collect it every single day. But he said on, the, on day seven, don't go out and collect any manna. Because there won't be any out there. But I will provide for you supernaturally so that everything that you collect on day six will be like a double portion and it will... It will be extended into day seven. And so some of the Israelites, thinking they knew better than God, they went out on day seven, and they're like, where's the manna? And Moses is like, oh, God. We told, we told you not to go out. But sure enough, then they went out, and they looked for manna, and there wasn't any manna there. But God said to them, okay, I'm not going to give you any, I'm not going to, you don't have to go out and collect any. I want you to rest. But all that you have collected, all that you have done, is going to go over into that seventh day. And so that's what happened. And so God, every seventh day, God was showing them the principle that he provides for them enough so that they can rest. And as we take that day off, as we take a rest, and we say, God... I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you so that I don't have to go out and collect manna. I don't have to go out and work. I don't have to go out and do that because my God provides for me. And my God provides rest, not only rest, but also the provision to pay for whatever I need on that seventh day. Writing another email on your Sabbath isn't going to bring you more provision. That's like just going out and looking for manna that's not going to be there. But trust God, let him be the one who provides for that seventh day, and you take your rest. God has given us the Sabbath. In these verses that we read, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. The Sabbath, the, the day of rest, is a gift from God. If you don't take your Sabbath, it's saying, yeah, God, I don't need the gift that you've given me. I don't need it. Thanks, but no, you keep your gift. No. If God's given us a gift, we'd be foolish not to take it because he knows what we need. Right? 
How many think that God knows what we need? How many people would admit that, yeah, God's a little bit smarter than I am? Right? Yeah? Okay, some people aren't lifting your hands. I hope everybody uh, feels the same way that I do. But if God wants to give us something, we would be foolish not to take that gift. And that's what the Sabbath is. It's a gift of rest from God. Can we go back to the Deuteronomy 12, or sorry, Deuteronomy 5, verse 15? Next slide after this one, the 15th verse. There we go. Okay, so this is the part I wanted to look at again. Why God gave us the Sabbath. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. When the Israelites were in Egypt, they were slaves. When they were slaves, they didn't have any days off. They worked seven days a week. They got up every single day doing the exact same thing, day after day after day after day. If they wanted to rest, they didn't have an opportunity to because they were slaves. And God goes on to say here, Therefore the Lord God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. He's saying that you were slaves back then, but you're not slaves anymore. So take the day off. If you work seven days a week, I would say you're a slave. God did a miracle for these Israelites. And God was, he, he, he miraculously brought them out of Egypt. And it's like he was pointing to them. This is my people. This is my people. So that all the other nations around them, the Egyptians that were remaining, the Canaanites, the Midianites, all of them, they saw the people of Israel. And they saw God providing supernaturally for them. And he saw that, they saw that they weren't slaves anymore. They saw that they didn't have to work seven days a week like all the other nations around them. They saw the freedom that these people had. Because God is their God. So when we practice the Sabbath and practice this principle of rest, it's like we're saying, God is my provider. God is my freedom. I am not a slave anymore. And God, and I trust my God. That's what you're saying back to God. But it's also a blessing for your own life as well. I would say that I would compare the Sabbath would be similar to tithing. Because tithing, we give 10% of all of our income to the Lord. And it's like saying, God, here's my 10%. I believe that you're going to do something greater with the 90% than I could do with my whole 100%. So I'm going to recognize you, God. I'm going to honor you, God. And so here we go. It's a principle of trust with your finances. With your rest, it's also a principle of, of trust with your time as well. You're saying, God, you know what? You're greater than I am. I'm going to rest. I'm not a slave anymore. And so, God, as I rest, I trust you. I trust you with, my, with provision. I trust you with taking care of all of these other things that maybe. Maybe my, my flesh wants to go and answer this email or do this or do that or, or work a little bit harder to try and provide for my finances or whatever. No, God, I'm going to put that aside and I'm going to live with the principle of rest. Because God is my God and I am not a slave anymore. I want to read a story, okay? This is just an example of someone who observed the Sabbath. In, in 1853, in the United States of America, there was a number of people who were traveling from the east part of the United States to the west part. Um, if anybody's familiar with history, this would be during the, the time of the Oregon Trail. And they were traveling from Missouri, from Kansas City, Missouri, to the northwest, which is, would be Oregon and Washington. The distance of, this, of, of the trail was 3,940 kilometers 
across the country. That would be like from, I just uh, looked it up today on Google, that would be like traveling by land from Phnom Penh to Kathmandu, Nepal. So like north of, way north of India, like a long, long ways, so almost 4,000 kilometers. And they would travel at the rate of about 20 to 30 kilometers per day because what they were traveling in was basically giant ox carts. And they would travel, they called it a, the, uh, like a, like they would travel in a big convoy. So there would be several families all along. There would be one leader and they would travel in a, in a, uh, at a rate of about 20 to 30 uh, kilometers a day. And so it would take several months. So they would start in the spring, try to get there before winter time so that they don't get froze out going through the mountain passes. So let me just read this. I'm just going to read it word for word here. This is about a lady named Phoebe. And in May of 1853, Phoebe and her husband Holden joined a covered wagon train near Kansas City, hoping to reach Washington Territory by mid-October, which was a distance of more than almost 4,000 kilometers over the rough Oregon Trail. Like all wagon trails, they elected a captain. And the captain's word was the law. The captain that they chose was Reverend Gustavus Hines. Only to be surprised that on one Saturday night, when the Reverend announced that the train would not travel on Sundays. So here they are. They got, they're literally have these constraints. Because if they don't travel fast enough and get there in time, it's going to hit the winter and everybody's going to die and freeze because they're not at some place where they can, um, where they can, uh, in a more warm place. So they, you know, they would, they, they need to be settled before winter comes. Let's put it that way. But he said, no, we're not going to travel on Sundays. Phoebe was shocked. They had half a continent to get across at a pace of about 20 to 30 kilometers a day on a good day. And there was at least four mountain passes, innumerable river crossings ahead of them. But she just sat in her wagon and fumed. One family deserted the train and joined another. On their first Sunday, while they stood still, an, uh, one train after another, they call them trains, but it wasn't trains. It was big, you know, it wasn't an actual train. It was a big group of people uh, with another captain, with another leader. One train after another passed them by, but being the daughter of a minister herself, Phoebe felt that they had no choice but to honor their captain. So they started out again on Monday, bright and early, only to reach the first river crossing on Tuesday evening. A long line of wagons stretched out ahead of them, waiting for the one ferry to carry them across. They waited for three days to get across that river. So that was on Tuesday they, they got there. So they waited Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. On Saturday, so they finally get across. Then on Saturday, they resumed their journey, only to be told that they would sit still and rest the whole next day. Phoebe was mad. This made absolutely no sense to her, since the minute, but the minister's daughter obeyed. A few weeks later, she began to see many, many dead oxen, mules, and horses all along the trail. They had been driven so hard that they collapsed and died. She started to admit that maybe the animals needed a day of rest. And it's interesting, in these, in these commands, it says the actual livestock get to rest as well. A few weeks later, she admitted that maybe the men needed to rest too, since most of them walked. Then slowly began to notice that as they worshipped on the Sabbath, ate, rested, and even played together, it had a remarkable, calming, and life-giving effect on people's spirits. There was less grumbling. There was more cooperation. She even noticed that they seemed to make better time during those other six days. Finally, what totally sold her on the value of the Sabbath happened one Sunday evening. The family that had deserted them at the beginning came limping into their campsite, humbly asking to rejoin them again. Phoebe had assumed that they were at least a week ahead. In fact, they were behind them. 
Their own wagon train, the whole wagon train, had broken down. Of course, they welcomed them back, and then they reached their destination in plenty of time, and as friends as well. And out of the 50 head of cattle that went along with them, only two were lost. Only two of them. And so that's just one example of a group of people honoring the Sabbath and how it can bring life and peace and rest and actually be more productive than many of the other uh, groups that were going along there with them. Uh, I don't have time to talk about it very much today, but if you want to read about another company, a Christian company in the States, read about Chick-fil-A. They always take Sundays off. But per, uh, per restaurant, they average way more money than lots of the other fast food restaurants in the United States. Number two, why do we rest? Why do we take the Sabbath? It gives us a chance to rest and be refreshed. Let's read Exodus 31, verses 14 to 17. Exodus 31. Can we put that up there? You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. Other translations of the Bible say that as a perpetual covenant. A perpetual covenant means ongoing over and over and over and over again. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day, get this, this is talking about God. And on the seventh day, he rested and he was refreshed. He rested and was re refreshed. Why does God need to rest? Does God need to rest? The Bible says God neither sleeps nor slumbers. Why does it, it says he rested and was refreshed? This word refreshed, it actually means to stop and take a big breath. To stop and take a breath. Sometimes in our lives, <laughs> we could all use a big breath of fresh air, right? Sometimes we just need to stop and say, oh, I need a breath of fresh air. The other part of this is when God breathed into man, he breathed his spirit into man. When you stop and take a rest on the Sabbath, it's breathing in the Spirit of God to bring refreshing to your spirit and to your soul. That's what the Sabbath is meant to do for us. It did it for God, and that's what it's meant to do for us as well. So take a breath on the Sabbath. What else happens when we don't rest? Or sorry, why else should we rest? Number three, because there are consequences when we don't rest. In the Bible, we just read that people who didn't observe the Sabbath, they were killed. Well, that's pretty serious. It's one of, there's only about four commands in the Old Testament where someone dies if they don't obey it. And the Sabbath happened to be one of them. Now, Thankfully, we don't uh, kill people anymore when they don't take a day off. But I think people who don't take Sabbaths on a regular basis are slowly killing themselves. God knows what we need for our lives. I was reading on a website, they say people who don't rest, um, <clears throat> There's higher chances of things like cancer and diabetes. There are, you know, psychological problems. And it just has a long, like the longer you don't rest, the longer you don't take that time off, it has a negative impact on your physical bodies. Because 
even if we don't recognize the spiritual side of it, the physical side of our bodies definitely needs rest. We need to be people who rest. We need to be on that perpetual cycle of work, rest, work, rest, work, rest. There are negative consequences when we don't rest. But number four why we rest is there are blessings when we do. Mark 2, verses 23, says, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Another, someone else quoted, More than Israel has kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath has kept Israel. And the Sabbath, the resting time, it sustains It brings life. It helps long life. You know, I was, I heard someone who just recently traveled to Israel and they, you know, they take the Sabbath to, you know, probably to extremes, but they're really serious about it. And some of the things they do are actually quite wise. One of the extremes that they would do is uh, my friend was, he was in his hotel and he was going up to his room. And he went into, he went into the, you know, the elevator opens and closes. He went into the elevator and there were some Orthodox Jews in the elevator. And so, you know, my friend just gets in. He goes to hit the button. And the, and the Orthodox Jews go, no, 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 no. They're not allowed to push a button on the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath, says, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, it says you're not allowed to light a fire. And so... They say that when you're pushing the button, it actually, the electrical current goes through the wires and you're making a small little fire in there. And so what they do, rather than having to push the buttons in the elevator, you go in the elevator and it stops at every floor. So it stops at the first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor, doors open every single floor. And then when it gets to your floor, then you get out. But they don't want you pushing any buttons on the Sabbath. And so that might be an extreme But there's other things that are really, really smart that uh, people in Israel do. Some of the the key things that uh, are, are, are main components of the Sabbath in Israel, sleep and rest, taking naps on the Sabbath, um, eating, they, they spend a lot of time on the day before the Sabbath preparing food and getting it ready so that they can just leisurely, uh, leisurely eat their breakfast, their lunch and dinners, spend time with family. And I love the way, you know, I love that word leisurely because it's just like, yeah, we're just going to sit around and eat, spend time together. We're not in a hurry to go anywhere. We're not trying to rush off and do this. No, we're just going to take that deep breath and spend time together. Another main component of the Sabbaths in Israel is reading the Word of God. Families will sit around together, read the Bible, read passages, what God's saying to you. And they'll do that and they'll, they'll mark the days. So the evening of the day before the Sabbath, that's when the Sabbath starts in the evening and then it goes to the evening of the next day. But it's just a a beautiful picture of rest and it's you know no we're going to we're going to do this we're going to trust our god and spend time together and refresh so what sort of things can we do on the sabbath well i think there's two questions here what things should we not do on the sabbath uh, and i would say things like work and things that would stress you out and you know oh i got have to do this in order to get things done. No, just leave that. Trust the Lord with it. Trust that everything is going to be okay. But these are some of my recommendations taken from some of my study that I would suggest would be things to incorporate into a Sabbath. Take 24 hours. Take the same 24 hours every week, whether it be it doesn't have to be on a Saturday, you know, Friday works better for you, or maybe even if Sunday works better for you. Take 24 hours as your Sabbath. Rest, sleep late if you can, take naps if you want to, 
Don't be worried. Don't be stressed about things. Read the Word of God, but don't be stressed like, okay, I have to get through these seven chapters, and I have to do this, and no. Just take it easy. Take a breath. Take a breath. And just read. You know, maybe you just sit and meditate on a couple of verses that the Lord's speaking to you. Talk to your friends about it. Talk to your family about it. Say, oh, this is what God's talking to me about. Gather together. Worship and pray if you want. Eat well. You know, if you, if you don't have time to prepare beforehand, go out and eat. But do it leisurely and in a, in a manner of celebration. Do things that refresh you. Go for a walk. Go for a drive if you want to. I would caution you on things like exercise, though. Sometimes exercise can be good and it's helpful for us, but if it's too much, it can be wearing and draining on you. So I'd caution you about trying to do too much in the way of exercise and that. But sometimes, you know, things that, you know, maybe a bicycle ride or something. Don't make it too strenuous, but just go out and have a good time and, you know, have fun with your family or meet with your friends. You know, watch a good movie or something. Do some things that you like to do. Do things with people that you love, but don't work. Don't work. Put that aside. Trust the Lord. I want to read a, a few verses here in closing. We're over a few minutes, but, but I, I, I know that the principle of rest, here it's, we're talking about some practical things that we could do, and I hope this has been an encouragement to all of us. I know as I've been studying, I'm like, man, I got to do better at this, and I got to protect it a little bit more, and I got to make conscious decisions every week in order to, to make this happen. I don't want it to be a burden for anybody, but God has blessed us with the gift of rest. And we would be smart to take advantage of that. Because in truth, it's going to lengthen your life. It will. It'll lengthen your life. Let's read a few verses. I'm going to read a few verses here. And I think we have these up on the slide. Number one, in Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7. You have these verses up there? Yes, there we go. This is one that I've been, you know, remembering and making a part of my life. Do not be anxious about anything. Other translations kind of flip that around. It says, be anxious for nothing. What are we allowed to be anxious about? Nothing. What does the Bible say? Be anxious about this. Nothing. So if you're full of anxiety, you're anxious about something, the Bible says, stop it. Don't do it. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. This is trust. This is rest. And the peace of God, that breath of God, that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want to be a person whose mind and heart is guarded with peace. So don't be anxious. Trust the Lord. The principle of rest is not just about a one day a week thing, but it's a daily attitude that we have. Don't be anxious. Okay. Take a breath. Trust God. Tell Him all of your requests. Thank God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Another verse, Matthew 11. A lot of us probably know this one. It says, Come to me, all who are labor, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God has rest for our souls. Amen? God has rest for our souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light this is the principle of rest here one more in psalms chapter 46 verse 10 be still 
this is the Sabbath principle right here. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. How? As you are still and know that I am God. That's like sitting here and saying, God, I'm going to sit and I'm going to rest. Oh, for sure, you got to work the six days. But on that seventh day, I know God's got my back. I know God's got this in his hands. And I believe with all my heart that rest equals trust. If you're worried about something, it's hard to sleep at night. You're thinking about things, you're your mind is going a million miles an hour. Sometimes you might fall asleep because you're exhausted, but then you wake up too early in the morning. Rest equals trust. And God wants us to live a life of trust where we say, God, I know you got this. I am confident in my God. I don't have to be in control. I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have to, you know, be the, I don't have to find answers to every situation. I don't have to be the one who finds, God's got this. I can rest. I can rest. I'm going to close with one story, a personal story. I might have shared this with you guys before, but it was a number of years ago when we were in another house, and we had, uh, robbers who came and hopped over the fence. We had a, you know, a tall gate with razor wire. They kind of pushed that away. And, and it was a time when, you know, after that happened, every single sound. Okay, so they came, they came into the yard and they stole different things that were out in the yard. They didn't get in the house or anything. But then I woke up the next morning and wow, this is missing and that's missing and I could see the spot where they had climbed over and all this sort of stuff. And you just feel like violated and fearful and man, what can I do to take care of this? I got to, you know, fix that razor wire and I got to make sure that this doesn't happen again. But then the next night, I could not sleep. Every single sound, I'm like, is that, that, is that them again? Is that them? Is they trying to get over again? Are they going to take more stuff? Bring all this stuff in the house so they can't get anything? They had even opened some of the windows and reached in and grabbed what they could grab. And, and I was not sleeping well. And, and I just remember God brought to my mind Psalm 23. And he said to me, Jason, I'm your shepherd. And if I'm your shepherd, you're just a sheep. You're just a sheep. So I'm your shepherd. And so I want you to put your head on your pillow just like a little, little lamb, and just sleep, just rest. And this, this was probably the second or third night that I hadn't gotten any sleep because after they'd come in. And that night, I slept like a baby. I slept so good, I, and I woke up, and I just felt refreshed, and I was like, God, I thank you so much that you are my shepherd. And I think that's, with all these verses, this is what God wants us to do. God wants us to live a lifestyle of rest because he doesn't want us living life by ourselves but rest shows that we are in relationship with a God who is involved in our lives and providing for us on a daily and a weekly and a yearly basis this is who God wants to be the Sabbath is a time for us to grow in trust. It's a time for us to grow in rest, trusting in God, saying, God, you got this. So let's do that. Let's be people. Maybe you don't take a good enough Sabbath. Ask the Lord this week, God, what can I do? Maybe you have to guard your time a little bit better on, on, on the day that, you're, that you take off. Maybe you need to make a commitment not to open your emails or answer certain text messages. Maybe you just have to take your phone and just turn it off for, for a day. The, world, the world's not going to come to an end if you don't have your phone on for a day. 
you know, it actually, you know, you actually might feel a little, a little bit liberated. Yeah, I don't have to check my phone every single, you know, every five minutes or whatever. But ask the Lord this week, God, what can I do? What can I do to show that I trust you, that I rest in you, that you are my source for everything? Let's be people who do that. Let's not just hear the word, but let's be doers of the word, okay? Let's all stand up together. And I'm going to pray for us. And as we pray, as I pray, I would like you to pray to the Lord as well. And just ask him, God, I want to live a life of rest. What can I do this week? Maybe it's something you heard in the message this afternoon. Maybe it's something that God is speaking to your heart and spirit. Maybe it's something new that, he speaks, that he'll speak to you right now. But just ask him, God, what do you want me to do? Let's just ask the Lord, each, each one of us, just ask the Lord right now. Heavenly Father, I pray for each one of us here. Lord, we are gathered together in your name as people who love you and are pursuing you. And today, as we've talked about, God, we are here to pursue you in trust and in rest. And God, we ask for each, ask for each one of us here that you would speak to our hearts individually about the steps that you want us to take. Maybe it's a step of deciding which day of the week is going to be my Sabbath. Maybe it's a step of being purposeful not to make appointments or to talk about work on the Sabbath. Maybe it's a step of being sure to rest rather than doing lots of other busy things on the Sabbath. But God, I pray for each one of us today as we take that step and as we make that effort lord i speak a word of refreshing upon each person the spirit of refreshing upon each one that they'd be like wow wow i i, I just received so much refreshing because i took those steps and god even as you were refreshed on the day seven we want to receive that new life, that new refreshing, that new spirit that you have for each one of us, God. Lord, we thank you for rest. We thank you that you are our God and we can rest and we can trust in you. God, I speak your blessing upon each one of us as we go this week, as we rest this week. Lord God, I speak your blessing upon each one of us. Help us to continue, not just for one week or two weeks, but help us all to live a lifestyle of trust and rest in you. We thank you for blessing us with your presence this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.